welcome to the Michael Uzo's podcast. Welcome back to the Michael Uzo's podcast. Today we welcome Nick Crozier. Nick and I have actually known each other for many years. Back, uh, I was at a goalie school in Mississauga. Nick was a shooter, so we worked together many, many moons ago. It feels like now. Uh, graduated from York University in a degree in kinesiology. Just uh, uh, we're very similar there, and he also played hockey growing up, uh, obviously as a shooter. Now Nick is a super successful agent um, in the greater Toronto area. He does extremely well. And his brand, Crozier Realty, and he crushes it on all things, everything. So welcome to the podcast, Nick Crozier. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me out here, man. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks for that intro. Make me sound real good. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, you know what? Uh, Nick was one of the first people when I when I got into real estate, I reached out to him. We kind of reconnected after a few years, of not uh, many years of yeah. not really talking. And um, I had I had saw you on Instagram and we reconnected again. And it was and you were a huge help for me in, in getting things started. So um, I really appreciate that. And I kind of want to go back to the beginning. Like, obviously you, you played hockey growing up, like talk to yeah. me a little bit about hockey and your transition into school and, and like how you got into real estate. Yeah, no, for sure. So yeah, I mean, like yourself, I grew up playing, played triple a, uh, junior got into there, into the university scene and then kind of shifted out, you know, you're just, you know, as growing up when you're playing hockey, it's all you do you live, breathe, sleep hockey. So you don't really actually give much thought. To, to be honest, you don't really give much thought into a career. You think it's going to last forever. You're just kind of like, what's next? What do I do? I've just just been breeding sports my whole life. So it's just kind of like that realization kicked in in university when you're, you know, it's like, okay, and you're like now what? What's going to happen? So I think I never really had a path. I knew I was like sales into that aspect of things, customer service, you know, did the kinesiology. I realized I didn't want to do kinesiology actually probably my third year, but I also didn't know what I wanted to do. So it was one of those where it was kind of like finish to finish for the sake of finishing type of thing. You know, um, I think it's one of those things, you know, whether you pick that up from playing sports or not all year, it's just kind of like that. You still got to finish the season. You know, we, we entered in this, we stuck it out. We're going to go through it. So I uh, finished up, got the degree. And then uh, from there, just uh, took off, st- uh, did some sales, bartended, did some sales jobs here, there, nothing crazy. Went down to Texas actually to do the firefighting thought that would be an avenue for me actually to do the firefighting, um, you know, blend that in with real estate part-time always liked real estate. Actually, when my buddy's mom got into real estate, uh, you know, he bought an investment property. I thought, yo, this is really cool. I want to do that. Um, so I don't really have a family background in real estate. A lot of people ask. So it was just really my interest in sales, uh, learning about everything. Um, you know, a big eye opening moment for me was I kind of tell the story sometimes, but in the firefighting schooling and everything we were doing down there coming from university background and whatnot i I realized halfway through and this was kind of something for my hockey career i kind of related to where you know i was a decent player had lots of skill but i gave no effort outside of the rink like i'm talking you know summers i played soccer i never like my parents are from the caribbean so i actually didn't know that you know while people are training in the summer i'm playing soccer i'm doing other things i wasn't even thinking hockey right it was just from a love of a game that I was able to have some skill and, you know, make it as far as I did, but it was something that I never actually said, Hey, I gave a hundred percent when I look back at it and say, you know, you always kind of hear, Oh, I could have played here. I should have played with this person. But it's like, you know, I never truly gave an effort to say that, you know what, I was at my best. And so that was something that resonated me when I was into firefighting. And I realized, you know, is, am I living up to my fullest potential, so to speak, right? And I just felt, you know, nothing against that industry at all. Uh, great, great life, great industry. I was going to do both. But, you know, the more I learned about real estate, I realized, wow, like this is, I control my own destiny here. There's nobody that's stopping me. You know, uh, a big eye opener for me was kind of like when I was doing the testing, it really brought me back to those rookie camps, those back in the day when you're already on the team and It's like, oh, we have to go to these. All right, we'll go show up and play. And all these kids are paying to come play in this one weekend tournament. And you're like, the team's picked. So the firefighting was very, very similar to that to me. And it just like, I don't know, that gut feeling in mind was just like, no, this isn't for me. I'm not going to keep doing this. You're not taking the best person. You're not, you're filling a quota. So it's like, you know what? I just don't want somebody else controlling my destiny. And I just said, you know, this real estate thing, What's the worst that can happen if I try my best for five years, 10 years, and 
I come up short, I can always go back. That was kind of my theory on it. Like, I don't want to, I never believe in plan B's, but yeah, on a grand scope, that's kind of what brought me to where I am today. Just a lot of reflecting actually from those uh, industries. That's amazing. And so did you go right into real estate right away? Like, so you came back from Texas. So, funny enough, like so, so I'll never forget it. It was a Friday afternoon and we were doing the math portion of our curriculum in Texas. And, you know, nothing against the guys. They barely figured out half of the math. Like I ended up teaching half the course because I did like I did university calculus like I did. And I'm not good. I barely pass those. But from basic, you know, it's a big difference. So I actually went home after school that day and applied to my real estate license to start the schooling while I was in Texas. So when I came back, I had the first course started as of January and I finished the semester there. So I literally like it was like, honestly, the TSN turning point and I just switched it that literally that afternoon that day. So it's kind of ironic how it all happened. But yeah, that was literally that day. I was like, no, this isn't for me. It's funny how that happens sometimes it just something clicks and it's like all right this is what i want to do yeah you know it's like it's funny i'm a big believer in the universe putting things out there and whatnot and even going there i was like delaying and delaying i'm like someone give me a sign is this for me am i i want to speed this up it was all always about like i feel like i'm behind in life you know i gotta speed up my career get there faster because you know you come out of university a little bit later when you're playing hockey and sports and if you don't make it or do anything then yeah you are starting if you want to stay a little bit later but it's not late at all. I mean, I look back and I look back now, I'm like, shoot, I should have even waited longer and like enjoyed it more like the rush to just work. You know, it's really funny when you, when you hear it as a kid, don't rush to go work. They're telling the truth. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's funny you say that. Like everyone says, says that when you're, when you're playing and it's like, you know, there's no hurry to retire because you can always like work after, you know, and, sure. and yeah. you don't really realize what that's like until like, like, when you're a couple years into your job, you're like, all right, just keep Literally, going to work. And yeah. I think, yeah, and I think the big, the big thing in terms of mindset for like everybody, it's just kind of like, you know, you almost have to sit there and enjoy the moment you're in. Sometimes we're so caught up with what's around us and what's the next move that it really does go to show. Like, man, I mean, I'm sure if you could go back ten years, you'd be like, wow, I really would have took in that big game, that championship, this, that win, that you know. You really look back and you're like, wow, like that is when literally the only thing that mattered was winning the next hockey game so you're kind of like now it's like this client that client this price this isn't happening it's like holy crap this is what i was rushing for <laughs> it's so true and um i remember that and I, I feel it now too in in real estate it's like okay you know what's next what's next you're always in that yeah, mentality you know, like, like you know, the next big paycheck oh i got i hit this goal okay how do i beat it now it's like man just think about the goal you just hit it's like a lot of the numbers we do in real estate are, are actually like very high, like, you know, in certain cases. So it is like winning a championship or a big game. It's like sometimes we forget to enjoy the moment in a sense. Yeah. And, and also enjoy the moment with with clients who just, you know, maybe they've if you've yeah. lost out on a couple bidding wars or whatever, like it, someone just bought their dream home. Like yeah. It's, it's and, an we, and we look at time, it. Right? We it. Yeah, exactly. We yeah. look at it because we do it and we take it for granted. All right, great. We All right, we want it. We tell our clients, great, cool. And then we're already thinking about deal two. It's like, that was such a big deal for that client. Like they don't do this often, right? It's not yeah. as common for them to win these big deals. So yeah, it's definitely, uh, definitely it's been an eye opener in that regard. Yeah, it's great. It's a good way of thinking too. And, and I try to make a point to make sure that, you know, I want the clients to know that I'm obviously happy for them. And like, it's so huge yeah. and it's such a big deal. Oh, of course. Um, Everything's a big a big milestone yeah. for everybody, right? In their own way. Sure. I mean, we'll never enjoy it the same way they will as their home, but. <laughs> of course. Um, so let's talk real estate. So you got into real estate. So year one, what was that like? You know, you got your license. Yeah, so, Where did you, where'd you go from there? Yeah, so year one, you know, hungry out of there. I'm like, I'm gonna make this something big. I, I you know, I've underdid a hockey career, blah, blah, blah. So I was kind of like, all right, find out who's doing what, who's making a lot of money. So that's pretty much what I did in my brokerage. Whoever made the most money went and talked to them right away. How are you doing it? What's going on? So, you know, I started to learn a little bit about the industry. I'm like, okay, like I don't know anybody. I started at 26. Given that you're looking and saying, okay, well, the average price is in Toronto. Nobody can afford if at that age for the most part. So where do I go to find people who want to sell? Well, door knock. So I pretty much built my business off door knocking because I didn't know anybody who owned a home to sell. And I barely knew anybody that can afford to buy a home. So 
I literally just spent my days door knocking. I door knock newer areas, um, higher turnover, townhomes, smaller price points. I went to new neighborhoods. So I was living in Mississauga, but I would drive to Milton um, and I would door knock Milton because the pocket in Milton was turning over. Like during busy, like every couple of weeks I'm seeing in this little pocket, like homes are popping up for sale. So I'm like, hey, let's go door knock and go at it. So I ended up getting about my first year, year and a bit, almost 11 listing appointments. And I probably only converted three. So I realized obviously there's a conversion problem and you know, you see it, you're like, oh, I was so good. Then you see that the person listed it at a higher price than you said, or the strategy you told them that wouldn't work worked, or, you know, you just sucked in presentations and you don't know. So through that, I was able to really know, like I'm getting stuff, but I need to fine tune this. How do I develop? How do I build? So, you know, like anything, I had a bunch of buddies that were all your Bay street finance guys and whatnot. And I, all, and I watched as they were growing and, and, moving up, you know, they really grinded out the first five, six years where they're slaving away doing garbage work for garbage pay, but they're going to get their school paid for that pay raise after five years is a huge jump. And one thing in the industry I've noticed is everyone always talks about like your 10 year marker. If you can make it to 10 years, you'll never look back because at that point you've accumulated almost two different cycles of buyers from mortgage terms. And if you just keep up and you're competent, you should be able to keep a business running, right? So I looked at it and said, okay, by the time I'm 35, I'll probably won't have to door knock every day again. Fast forward, you know, six years in the business now, you know, it, it just really amplified and sped up my, my um, business, if you want to call it that. But I would say the first three years, none of that return started coming into the fourth and fifth year. So it's one of those things where we're in such a business where everyone says what you do today will be 90 days out. I honestly truly believe who you help today will be three to five years out. And that's kind of what I've been building and kind of getting back to that now. It's just the plan of always being ready ahead in terms of what you're preparing yourself for and just really understanding and enjoying the process as we go through it. Okay. I love that. I mean, there's, there's tons to unpack there and I want to, I want to break that down a little bit. Yeah, um, it's a long-winded answer. No, to, but to it, the, but it, it's it's amazing. It's it's so amazing, and uh, for me, just starting year three to hear that kind of stuff is is great. And and I want to unpack. Let's start here with door knocking. Yeah. Your your first year in the business, you don't yeah. you don't know anybody who's ready to buy your house, so you're yeah. you're yeah. thinking the opposite. How can I go find people looking yeah. to sell their house? So yeah. I want to unpack that a little bit on the door knocking, and then I want to um, jump into how you refine your presentations to start getting a better conversion yeah. rate. Um, we'll get to that in a sec. So let's talk door knocking. Yeah. What did that look like for you from the start to like where you started to get the opportunities at the table? Like, so when you yeah. first started knocking on people's doors, were they just like, "Hey, come on in, Nick. Let's have a seller presentation or listing presentation"? Yeah, no. So it was. <laughs> it, honestly, it kind of was. So. Um, at our brokerage, we have like a, an eight week crash course training thing they called bold or whatever. And it was just about making contacts talk. So they kind of kicked me in to really set up a structure. So I like, I started the course before I was legally licensed. So I couldn't actually door knock my first two weeks. Um, but it literally just came down to, I didn't have a presentation. Uh, I didn't have anything. I'm a big believer in it's all about the action you're doing the minute you have something in front of you, you will figure out the solution. So I just figured, you know, I can spend all my time trying to come up with this amazing listing presentation, buyer, this, that we get caught up with the image, the look, the, this. So I just said, screw it. I'll go door knock. And when I get the opportunity, I'll figure it out. You know, I, I, I think one of the best quotes I live by is Elon Musk. And uh, when he says, if you want to do your task list by the end of the month or the end of the day, both of them will be achievable. It's whatever, um, whatever uh, timeline you set. So it was kind of one of those where I just said, let me just go get opportunities and I can figure the rest out. And sure enough, that's literally what it looked like. Like I remember my listing presentation, I put together like two days before uh, my first appointment. It was literally, and then the first appointment I ever went on was with another agent. I didn't have a listing presentation. So it was kind of like, yeah, like it was one of those where I look back and I'm like, holy crap, these people like still trusted me to do the deal and we did we got it done so i think you know there's a little ignorance in the beginning but there's also just that like you know i always say it and i say it to younger agents too i just like if you're new in the business and you have one listing 
you know, the reassuring thing to the client is you have nothing else going on, but their one home. Your only objective is to sell this home. So it's like, you know, from that, you just kind of go. And that's what I did. So it was like, yeah, like literally knock on the doors, you know, whatever sold in the neighborhood. Hey, did you just see this sale? Oh no, I didn't. What did it sell for? It was three bedrooms sold for this price. You guys thought about selling. No, no, we're not. And, I, and keep in mind, I was in a new area. So most people have only lived there a year, but they bought pre-construction three years ago. So life can change in those four years, um, which is also why the area was a higher turnover. So a lot of people, A, because it was pre-construction, they don't have agents because they bought from the builder and it was a resale, not a condo. So builders don't even pay that. So again, if you're thinking about door knocking and you're new, pick a neighborhood that's pre-con that's new. They don't have agents. So that was a big thing for me. And then it was just really, they were younger demographic. I was younger. I tried to connect that way. Um, you know, a lot of younger would more relate to me and less likely to be asking about years of experience in XYZ. Um, and then even then you just take an experienced agent. Like I did it, I did one property, which was a million dollars. And I had my coach at the time, cause we get a coach with the brokerage. She came with me and helped me through the listing. So it was one of those where I think everyone's very caught up on the money aspect, but in your first couple of years, if you're just willing to learn, I think you will propel yourself so much further ahead. Like I can tell you when I left the team. I went so much further ahead because of all the learning I learned and you don't realize it. So I just want to, yeah. Okay. Well, let's <laughs> continue to break this down. This is great. Um, uh, when you were door knocking, just to kind of yeah. pull that in 360, like, did you show up? Did you have anything to hand out to them? You said, Hey, you know, the property just sold Not three bedrooms, three baths. No. nothing. And even today, when I door knock, when I talk to the people at the door, I don't give them anything. It's actually the, the stuff I leave behind is honestly, it's a mixture of me feeling good that I'm leaving a flyer on the door. But like for the most part, other than actually during COVID, most of those just sold flyer signs or whatnot, they really don't have much of a hit rate. I can honestly say it's the impact of when you're in front of them at the door and you talk to the person, you're speaking the information and the purpose is to gain the information. So you give them the info, they give you theirs. So that was kind of how, but no, in the beginning, short answer, no, I didn't have anything with me. I just literally had like a piece of paper. I just treb stats like that and just told me what the recent sales were. And I would literally make notes on the paper with whoever would give me their information. And, you know, from that, I just started building a database and, you know, most of your door knocking. And that's the thing with our business. Most people you meet, your clientele, everything you do is not going to happen today. So it was very, there was maybe out of all the door knocks, maybe three people. One was literally like we were interviewing agents this weekend. Sure. Come in for an interview. So that was like the one rare one. And there was maybe one more that was like, wow, you literally got us. Like we just started talking about it. But other than that, most of the time you're following up, following up. So like all the door knocking I did for the first six, seven months of my real estate career, I lost all the appointments and stuff the following year from all, but it was all follow up. Right. So it's like, you get the opportunity though. Now, were you, would you go back like month after month? Would you go back like every few months? Like what did that yeah, look like? So I just the same small little pocket. Yeah. And I literally picked a pocket so that realistically, if you can find a neighborhood or in an area and divide it into four quadrants, roughly speaking, you can door knock each quadrant basically at least once a year. And then and you're just going in a circle. So depending on how, sorry, once a quarter. So each quadrant should take you about a month or so, maybe less than that three weeks to door knock each quadrant so that every quarter you're door knocking the same neighborhood. And usually you'll get anywhere from a 20 to 30% hit ratio. So with those numbers, if you're door knocking the right neighborhoods enough, you're going to eventually talk to everybody. Some you'll talk to again. And if you're in like a farming neighborhood or somewhere you live or where you know you're going to be around, right? You start to make mental notes. You take notes of the neighborhood. You take notes of the people you spoke to, you know, you might meet someone that says I'm never leaving. So, you know, that conversation at the door might be different. You might see them outside. Oh, Hey, how's it going? I know you're not going anywhere just in the neighborhood again. And now you're just building a rapport with the area in the neighborhood because most of the people will talk, right? The one thing I've actually heard before was, oh yeah, like you, the neighbors were talking, especially in bigger neighborhoods where 
it's a little bit more uh, an older demographic. They talk to each other. So if you're this young kid or the new person coming around, knocking on all these doors consistently, you're going to start sparking some interest by the neighbors. Yeah, that's cool. I, I like that concept a lot, dividing it up by quadrants. It, it also makes it less daunting, right? You look at a whole- Yeah, you look at a big neighborhood, you're like, holy six thousand <laughs> homes, how the hell am I going to do this? But then you break it down to like two each quarter. You're like, oh, this isn't that bad. And then it just becomes in your schedule. Like it's engraved, like literally this morning, 10 o'clock to 11, I was door knocking. Like, do you have knocking. any, do you have certain, uh, certain hours that you find you've had more success in? I used to, again, I can argue it till I'm blue in my face and my broker will always challenge me. But on average, you'll get about 30% of the people home, no matter what time of the day it is. I find since COVID, the numbers have actually increased in the morning because more people are working from home. Whereas I found before you probably like, again, it comes down to price point because you can get more people in the afternoon in certain areas, but again, they're busy. Their kids are back from school. They're making dinner. So it's, your conversation may not be as great, but again, you're quick at the door. It's not about me talking to you, getting to know you. It's, do you want to sell right now? Yes or no? No, great. Have a nice day. Have you thought about it? And it just depends on the neighborhood you're talking to. Like the one thing with door knocking, you have to understand your demographic, who you're talking to. And if you're going to go to the door, you know, bring something of value to the door. If you're going to be in an older neighborhood, okay, well understand who are you talking to? Okay. Well, they don't care what the last sale prices are. Have you guys thought about selling in the next year or two or downsizing? Yes or no. So you can almost change your verbiage a little bit to make it more like even a survey of the neighborhood. And even from there, you're getting ideas. Where are you going to go? So what I always say about door knocking, if you look at it as like a drag, I'm just trying to find deals. Yeah, it sucks. But if you look at it from a standpoint of how can I learn the neighborhood, understand who's living here, who the buyers are, who the sellers are. Now you're taking a different picture because if you're going to be in this neighborhood, right? You're going to get a listing at some point. Well, you got to talk to the homeowners, talk about the neighborhood, talk about the people, talk about, and they know who those people are, right? So it's, I always say you're building your tool up toolbox for the listing when you get it. Yeah. I love that. Um, so now let's talk getting the appointment. So now you've door knocked, you've, you've got a seat at the yeah. table. Uh, where did that start for you? You said you went out, you ended up with honestly 11, at bats, I call it like, you know, if you're going to bat 11 yeah, yeah. times and you're, you know, you're getting three listings, like that's a pretty good percentage, honestly, in your first year, I would say that's fantastic. Um, yeah. I think if I, if I add it up, yeah, it was one, two, yeah, yeah. Three or four. four. Yeah. But let's talk about where that started and where it is now. So I'm sure now, you know, you, you have your stuff like, <laughs> of course. Yeah. I mean, and that's the thing, like I was always okay with public speaking presentations, like high school, whatever, I would rather do like a presentation and like talk than write an essay. Right. Um, so, I mean, in terms of people skills, speaking, I was always okay. You know, bartending definitely helped out a lot with that customer service aspect and, you know, the client comes first, that win-win attitude. So I think that aspect of things was great. It was the knowledge of understanding the presentation, the sales part, the, you know, how to speak about commissions, how to talk about objections and the handling and the scripting that is where it really became something to me where it's like you know it really is important to understand that and that's kind of where i started to realize okay i need more at bats like you said so that i can learn how to talk so that was when i really started to look into how to join a team and to keep in mind at my age at 27 at this point 28 i never bought a home yet right so I didn't actually really understand the complexities of a lot of the deals, selling, buying. Like I remember I lost a listing appointment because I didn't tell them the commission was plus HST, right? Something so minor and trivial, but I should know it, right? So there were little minor errors I was making that were big errors, right? And as so be it, I, I shouldn't have got it. But so what I did was I joined a team. And you know, big thing for me was I wanted to think big, who can I learn from, where can it be? A lot of the team leaders who did run teams were older, you know, they were in like probably their late forties, fifties, sixties. And I'm like, okay, you know, you guys have been in it 20, 30 years. I can make that money, but the way I'm looking at it, that's 25 years from now, there's gotta be another way. So I ended up teaming up with somebody who was actually 35 or six at the time. So I'm like, okay, this is attainable. And he was doing numbers that were bigger than some of these teams that I was looking at. And I'm like, whoa, you're doing this at this age. So it is attainable. I can do this. So 
I think that was a big factor for me, um, just understanding and knowing where I wanted to go. And yeah, I joined the team. I didn't really care about the splits at that time. Obviously, like they matter, of course, you know, income and whatnot. But what I really honestly, from what I learned in the year and a half, call it two years I was on the team, it, it, it turned everything into what I do today. Yeah, that's, I find that so interesting. And like, it, it's, it's really a tough way to wrap your head around sometimes. It's like, you're, I, I always say it all the time. Like I, the only reason I didn't join a team to start was because one, my age, I, I've bought and sold uh, yeah. numerous times in, in my career or life at this point, but also my, my dad's an agent. And that's a big resource for me that sure. I ask a ton of questions to where yeah. it's like a little, like, you know, it took some time when you get started, like you're not like, like when you're in an office or at, I mean, it was, it was the offices weren't even open when I started, but, yeah, exactly. but now, now that we're back in, it's like, it's taken me a lot of time to, you know, talk to agents that are, you know, doing yeah. amazing things. And so like having my dad was like essentially a way of yeah, you had that, not, that not getting on a team, but I do find if you're a newer agent, there's so much value in learning from somebody who's yeah. doing it at a high level. There, there's tons of value if you, but you're going to give up, you, like you said, you're going to give up the part of the commission, the split, but yeah. what's, you know, on the other end of it in a couple of years time, or even if you stay on that team and just keep growing and things like well, that, it's still a good option too. Where, yeah. Like, especially now that I'm developing my own team and I think myself and even my old team leader from to this day, he'll, he'll probably admit like, you know, you always had that skill set to go on your own. Like, doesn't matter if I left in the one and a half, two, he would have had a hard time keeping me no matter what. So it was like, and I think a lot of team leaders understand that certain people are built for that, but I do think everybody should join the team in the beginning. I think there's a very, very big misconception with our industry. Um, you know, we know that the average agent is doing only four to six deals. And if you're a newer agent, you're probably not even hitting that four to six deal until your second or third year, especially if you're younger. And it's just like, with so many people in the real estate industry and so many bigger teams and this and that you're going up. It, you're literally a small little animal in this big jungle, right? So it's like the faster you can team up with the lions, learn what the lions are doing. Then you can decide, do I want to be a lion or do I want to walk with the pack? That's what I always say. There's no wrong or right answer. Cause you can have a really good income, a really good life on a team, off a team. There's people that have been on teams for 10 years, eight years, seven years. Like there's no wrong or right answer. I think our egos are what get us in real estate because the image is everybody makes so much good money, but it's like we confuse the money we're making with like, what I always say is our GCI, our gross commission, what everybody goes off of is what we think we earn. But the reality is our real money is our net numbers. And I think that's the big misconception with a lot of people in the industry. Um, so yeah, I think it's definitely a team will bring you to there. I was lucky enough to be on a team that was number two in Canada for the company. So I literally was be able to see, you know, the team leaders doing 80, 90 deals a year, the team members that were at the top are all around me here. So I'm able to script with the top people. I'm able to, you know, have these opportunities to go on listing appointments. Like I think, I mean, I always say it, I tell people to ask them, but uh, I think I messaged him almost weekly. Which listing appointment do you have? Can I come on it? Which ones can I come on? If he didn't have any, I next person in line, next person. And I literally made it a point to go on every single listing appointment I could. I'll tell the story today where I had an investment seminar that he was putting together for a group of families from his, from his kid's school. I drove to Guelph at 9 p.m. to sit there for two hours to listen to them talk. I had no skin in the game. I don't even know if those people bought investment property. But it just being there was so valuable and understanding and learning. Um, but I also made it a point to take everything I could from this team, right? Not from ripoff standpoint, but I want to learn what do the admins do? What does the operations manager do? What does it mean to be an operations manager? What do your roles look like? What's this cost, that cost? So I really made it a point to try to dig in and learn everything that I could. Yeah, that makes sense too. And I, I do think that there is a like you said, there, there's a certain type of person too. like, you know, you, and I'm sure you being on that team and, and I would, I would think of this at some point too, is like you, 
when you're going to hire someone, you know, with that kind of mentality, you probably know that they're going to be time limited on what they're going to contribute to your team. Like you, if you hired yourself, right? Like let's say you're about to hire yourself and uh, someone came to interview. You're like, I see this kid in me and you're like, he's going to be with me for two years. I'm going to work with him, help him, teach him everything. He's going to really propel my business in those two years, but I know he's going to leave me. Yeah. And I think that's where I also have, been able to build. So that was a massive question that always lingered in my head. Um, and you know, a big thing I would encourage people to do too, if you are a couple years in the business or you're not, or you're, you know, you're trying to get to that next level. Like what I did when I left the team, cause I didn't have a coach anymore. I actually went out of my way and I wrote down four names at the beginning of every month. And I would try to talk to each one of those people, whether it be I meet them, whether it's a coffee call, a phone call, whatever it has to be. If they'll give me 20 to 30 minutes of their time, I had a list of questions for everybody. And I just made it a point. And honestly, that is what has really, really developed me into how I built my team and the structure and the foundation from it. Um, And yeah, you're right. You're not going to keep everybody. But at least if there's an opportunity that you can help them grow, and if I can extend that person an extra two years with me, when it would have been two, now he's with me for four, maybe it's six, then the inevitable is the inevitable. But I would rather be able to say, hey, these guys were with me for four years, all seven of them, they went from making no money to 300, 350, now they're all building their own business. Is that something you would like to do? And ultimately, some will say yes and some will say no. But at least you have been given them the opportunity to do so. Um, I think if you're able to do it that way, and the way I have mine projected and stuff is I have that in the back of my, my mind always. How do we keep the talent? So, you know, through that, my team structure, my splits are different. I've given more opportunity. I've almost looked at it a total different way. Um, so, again, very eye-opening, right? Because it's like, how do you keep these people? And in a sense, it's like, in a way, you never really do keep them you have to build something that wants them to stick in or they want to be a part of. So it's almost like we come from a standpoint, from a business model, how do I keep you? It's like, no, 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 I don't want to force you to be here. I want you to feel you're building something together. Yeah. And that's, that's a huge difference though. Like it's a massive yeah. difference from a mentality it is. standpoint. It is. And yeah, and from even from a team standpoint, because the course. team standpoint is usually the vision of the team leader, what they want versus well, what's the team what what's the benefit for everybody here if you want to do eight deals a year you do eight years a, you you do your eight but i want you showing up to everything your lead generating and your culture is there so i think it's just learning those little things and having the right support um has really shown me a lot yeah that's awesome uh when i went to U- university of new brunswick uh, the coach gardner mcdougall he that was his thing the, the reason i actually chose to go there he's like mike I know you want to play pro you come contribute to the program one two three years doesn't matter but you come you yeah. you contribute and then off you go but i just yeah. want you to contribute while you're here and that that's yeah. all like it was a kind of like it's weird to think now but like i really you know i think of it from now this perspective of you know at some point I, i'd love to start a team and it's like okay yeah. well how do you make that the same kind of environment like someone can come learn from me for however long but then you know either a are they going to want to stay because it's a good team environment or b yeah are they going to contribute and then you know like you said you've helped them grow and it's like it's almost like a feather in your cap to be like look this person was with me now look at them now and and i'm sure you'll always give credit to the person you worked with to be like look this guy really helped me and i know you've already said that to me before um yeah, and I've said it. Yeah, I'll always give credit in that regard because it's, it was the learning experience to develop, right? And I think yeah. there's two ways team leaders even look at it. Like some team leaders look at, oh, this guy used me and left. Or you can look at it as like, no, like that's your marketing piece. Look at this person now. And the most people who are going to join the team are coming to you because they need help. They need to get to the next level. They need to get to a level, right? So it's like, look what I produced or helped get to is this you? Some will say yes, some will say no. Because the reality is, if you're doing anywhere from five to 10 deals, or you're doing 200 to 250 GCI, depending on how you're running your business, um, you know, your net numbers, you're still in the low hundreds. So you're more like that kind of a producer. Whereas on team, sometimes 
you could be. And I think that's the biggest thing when looking at it for people deciding for themselves. It's do I have the brokerage resourcing? Do I have agent resourcing, family help? Do I have cousins? Do I have this? And then you have to be honest with yourself when you look back after your first year, first two years and say to yourself, okay, okay, mom and dad sold, okay, uncle sold, sister bought, you know, best friend bought. And then you're sitting there, well, I get six deals, but you know, there was nobody outside my small circle. So, you know, let's get real, where are the deals coming from, right? So I think that was the one thing I always, not prided, but I always realized if I can do more cold business, eventually they'll use me because of that. And that was always my plan. Yeah, that's that's unreal. So now that you're you got everything going for you, if you could go back to the start of your career, like at this point right now, what would you have done differently, if anything? Um, Six years later. My taxes. <laughs> if there's one thing I can tell you, it's that. Um they don't tell you or teach you anything about taxes in that Oreo book. I'll tell you that for free right now. Holy crap. Um, but if honestly, if I were to do anything differently, I truly would have been better at following up and more door knocking. If there's honestly something I could say, I, it sucked. I honestly should have doubled down and lost the ego a lot sooner. It took me a good eight to nine months to really accept going on a team and it took honestly a full year for me to really accept it and go to it. Um, and you know, it came through, like you said, when you started, I was so immature at 26 coming into an industry in a world where you're selling people's homes with massive commissions that can be coming in. And you're just so ignorant to the level of importance this is for someone's family. It, it was just very naive to the whole thing. So I think I probably would have been a little bit more on top of it in that regard, but I think, you know, it wouldn't have brought me to where I am today. So I can't really say there's a lot of anything I would regret, but I think I would definitely have doubled down more on my open houses, my lead gen, and really my follow-up. I think follow-up probably lost me from all the door knocking I did. And like when I look back every year and I go through my database, I'm like, crap, crap. It's like, crap, all you have to do is call them. They gave me your info at the door. Yeah, I, I, I think that's that's such a big thing though, but you don't really... I almost feel like it's one thing that gets left out of a lot of training is like, how do you follow up consistently? Yeah, and it's it so is. important, and right? Like that's, that's literally, yeah. Like our job is like, and I can even say like last year alone, I sold a house for 2.4. That was a door knock from three years prior. Right. And it was just following up and it was just every six months sending an email. You know, if I door knock back in the neighborhood, making sure I stop at the house. So they remember who I am. And it really was one of those conversations at the door where it was, you know, when I did finally call them and they, they were ready the September of 2021 and we sold last year, um, you know, it was, Hey, yeah, we remember you. you, they run their own business. They were like, remember you, you young kid, you were at the door, come on in, let's hear what you have to say. Right. So it was like, great. Now you got, like, cause I mean, what show is more hardworking than you're at the door knocking. Right. I mean, I think. The big cool thing with real estate is very similar to sports is you get praised for the one job you did, but no one actually sees everything you did to lead up to that deal. Just like in hockey and sports, it's all the extra practice, the stuff that no one's looking at that actually is what makes you better for the big day. hundred percent. That's what, that's one thing that I think, especially anytime anyone relates hockey to real estate and I've, I've said this a million times but it's the same it's the same uh sport different business it's exactly yeah. the same um look, but honestly if you look at any business whether you're in real estate mortgages lawn care it doesn't really matter if you're in a self-employed business if you take a kobe or a mentality a gretz you name it take a kobe mentality any sport you will succeed. It's just time in it. That's really all it is. Yeah, and it's it's not also it's also not like about someone someone asked me that like when I was first starting like oh you, like you used to be a hockey player like you're gonna be so competitive like it's good you're so competitive I'm like honestly nothing will make me ever like I will never find that competition level of like no. find like trying to stop that little hockey puck but. Yeah. <laughs> the back end stuff of the discipline that it takes to just, you know, be a player yeah. and show up every single day and, 
the games are the smallest portion of what we actually yeah. do on a year to year basis. And I, I, I relate it so much to like when, you know, a game in not a game, but like in the same kind of thing, like, you know, if the yeah. Leafs are playing, it's like you see the game, but in, in real estate, like it's an offer night or it's a, yeah. you know, you're presenting an offer or something like that. That's like the, the parts that you prepare for as you're yeah, doing all the other stuff look, along the way. To be honest, the listing presentation of I want to sell my house, that is game seven. So everything that I'm doing is for game seven right now. And if I get it, all right, we made the playoffs. Now we got a series. We still got to sell the home, right? And I think there's a big, big misconception, especially when you're young, where you think like, oh, you're bringing all this value to people. And I find it a lot when you're like, I don't want to join a team or this. It kind of goes back to that. And it's like, take it back. Like, you know, they don't throw the goalie in net for game six that's been in the AHL or here. He doesn't know what's going on. He doesn't know what's going on on the ice. He doesn't know the full play happening. He doesn't know what's going to power play. Strike. You know what I mean? There's so many elements that go on behind the scenes that they don't know. Right. And I always say this too. It's not all because, you know, you get some agents that are like, can you come on a listing and help me? It's like, I can come. But okay, but I don't I just want the listing presentation. It's like, but you're not understanding the listing presentation has so much involved in the behind and what has to happen after that. If you just want someone to walk in the door and get you a listing, you're going to end up losing the game still because there's so much more to it. And I think that's the big part that nobody realizes. And that comes down to doing the boring stuff we don't like doing the door knocking the cold calling, the lead gen, the practicing your listing presentation, the scripting, how you're going to say things like those are actually the things that actually make our business and make our dream happen. If you want to call it that, I don't know if dreams the right word, but <laughs> business. Yeah. yeah, definitely. And I, and also being on the ground with, with yeah. clients and knowing what's happening in the pulse of the market and yeah. even being in the office, you, you get a pulse of what's going on in yeah. the market. Like yeah, it's, exactly. it's super important. Market. What happened here? This condo had this many offers that, okay, now I can talk to my clients this way. Like there's so much that encompasses this industry that nobody teaches you or tells you about. So yeah, it's just one of those where I, there's just so much value from it. Yeah. I love that. Um, what are your thoughts on the market right now? I mean, we're, we're third week of April right now, uh, 2023. What are your thoughts? What do you think? What, what do you think is coming you know, it's, of right now? And funny, what's so, yeah. What's coming. Honestly, uh, you know, I don't know what's going to happen in this spring market's going to heat up. It's funny. Cause I had a content video that I'm going to post because I filmed it in March and what I talked about in March is happening right now. So it was interesting. It's very reflective of 2017 to me right now where there was this little, there's a big jump into the fall of 16 into January, February. We didn't have it this year cause that all skipped, but there's a quick, quick, quick little April, May jump offer bidding, bidding, bidding. And then all of a sudden flat plateau for the summer. I don't know if that will happen. I don't mean flat in pricing. I just mean, you're going to see a lot more inventory come on the market. I don't think you're going to see as many bidding wars happening and things going on come July, August. I think the market is just in a quick little. Honestly, it's a quick load trampoline jump right now. And then I think it's going to slow, um, you know, funny enough, I was looking up the stats today, actually literally like an hour before we jumped on, um, you know, an interesting thing I saw was from now we were looking at showings and I'll keep it quick cause it gets boring, but long story short, 60% of the showings have, we've seen a 60% increase in showings since February. And on average right now, March and April, since last April, we have seen um, on average last April, there was about 20,000 showings in the Toronto real estate board on Toronto this April, 50,000. So we have seen now showings almost double. And in March we saw 45 as the average number. So what's, and then when we had February, January, 26, 25. So what is that telling you? The buyers are all coming and flooding the market right now. We don't know how long they'll be here for, but they're going to be purchasing some stuff. Now, I don't think it's going to continue as crazy throughout the summer, but if you were to ask me in your next two months, three months, if you wanted to sell, I'd say sell. Yeah. That... Moving into the fall next year, when rates change, we don't know. There's too much going on in terms of the economic factors to really predict, but I think you're going to see more of a lull come August, September, if you're looking to purchase. Um, but I wouldn't let that be a determinant because it's already going to jump up this spring. So you're purchasing at the jumped up price, right? So it's like, People think, oh, I'll wait, I'll wait. It's like, you can wait, but you might have more stability at a higher price point. Yeah, and that's that's the key is that, sure, there's stability, but if the price is up, then 
Exactly. It's what I always tell everybody, and this is literally, we could say it till we're dead, whatever, it, you know, you can't time real estate. It's not a stock market. It's not a company. It's not this, there's, unless you're purchasing for investment purposing, different, but the average buyer in real estate is living in the home. You cannot time your lifestyle right? You can't time your life. You have to just make the decision which works best for you in that moment. What I always say is if it works, it works. If it doesn't make sense, don't do it. Love that. Uh, let's wrap up with that. I love yeah. that. I love that quote. Uh, Nick, thank you so much for jumping on. Yeah, this was, this was so fun. Um, a lot of, a lot of great stuff in there, whether you're a, you know, a new agent, a seasoned agent, lots of stuff in between. Uh, I think everyone's going to get a lot of value out of this and, uh, appreciate it. Thank you so much. Yeah, I appreciate you for having me. Yeah, no, it's awesome. I mean, whoever's listening, if it's a sports background, whatnot, man, run your career like your sports background or think of yourself as a professional athlete. And you know what I mean? Like I've said it before on a panel, you know, the average hockey player pro, the salary is $2 million. They're only netting 30% of that. You know, when you work out your numbers, a real estate agent can make more. And you're not up every single day, flying every other night, going through the schedule they're going through. So, I mean, look at it that way and it puts it in perspective. Uh, the only one thing I would say that's different is you're not done uh, practice at like 12 o'clock in the day. So yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's it. Um, <laughs> if you've been watching this long and you want to like and subscribe, um, throw in a review on Apple Podcasts and you're watching on YouTube, uh, definitely a like and subscribe would be awesome. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Nick. Uh, appreciate you tuning in.